Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Today is our briefing, Energy Earthshots, the Frontier of Climate Innovation. I'm Dan Bursette. I'm the president of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. And I'd like, by start, I'd like to start by thanking Representative Paul Tonko and, sustain, and the Sustainable Energy and Environment Coalition for helping us with the room today. It's always really, really great to work with that office. Would you believe it? ESI is celebrating 40 years of advancing climate solutions through congressional education. ESI was founded in 1984 by a bipartisan group of members of Congress and has since then worked to provide science-based information about environmental policy, energy policy, and climate change topics to policymakers and the public. We also, over time, have developed some expertise helping utilities in rural areas access Department of, Edu uh, Department of Agriculture uh, funding and financing resources. What congressional education means to EESI is a lot, but it's mostly briefings. We do a lot of briefings. Briefings every couple weeks, we're up here on the Hill, bringing the best information we can to congressional staff to help them keep up to date with everything happening in climate policy. Two weeks ago, we were in this room to talk about the fifth national climate assessment. We'll be back up in a few weeks to talk about innovations in weather forecasting, the appropriations and budget process, <laughs> ocean carbon dioxide removal, and even more. Everything is always available online and free of charge, and you can sign up for our newsletter and access all of our briefings to date by visiting us at www.esi.org. Um, we try really hard. We understand what it's like to be a congressional staff person. We understand what it's like to have your boss show up late on an afternoon before they take off, I say, asking hard questions about climate policy. What's this mean? What's this energy earth shot all about? Well, I would really appreciate it if when you Google energy earth shots, you also Google EESI, because that will bring you to this resource and with this tremendous panel and our tremendous keynote speaker. We want our resources to be timely, relevant, accessible, and practical. And we put a lot of thought into that. For example, when we start to get farm bill text, which will happen some point in the future, we actually have uh, almost two dozen side-by-side -side comparison charts standing by so to help congressional staff very quickly compare what the House is proposing and what the Senate is proposing. Our newest resource was just fa uh, blasted today. My colleague Molly's been working very, very hard on our fossil fuel subsidies fact sheet and it addresses proposals in Congress as well as the President's budget request to repeal uh, over a dozen fossil fuel subsidies. Um, that's actually on the front table as well. It's much better for you to have this information before you need it, and we know that, and you can count on us to help. The Department of Energy does a lot of great stuff, and we've been extremely fortunate over the years to work with our friends at the uh, Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy on briefings, articles, and podcasts about the Earthshot Initiative and other programs. The Department of Energy, and I'm talking about the entire agency, from EERE to the Office of State and Community Energy Programs, to the Office of Science, to the offices of the Secretary and the Deputy Secretary and the Undersecretaries, is on the vanguard of innovation. And now more than ever, also on the vanguard of the deployment of technologies and programs that are absolutely essential to our efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by at least 50% by 2030. And that brings us to today. We're going to be talking about DOE's energy earth shots. These are designed to rapidly break down market barriers and scale up innovation in eight key sectors to address the climate crisis. That includes enhanced geothermal energy and floating offshore wind. It includes low carbon industrial heat and affordable home energy. These earth shots set ambitious goals to tackle the critical energy challenges of our time. Now I'm going to turn it over via video remarks to uh, one of our, uh, our friends on the House Science Committee, Chairman Frank Lucas. Uh, Representative Frank Lucas represents the 3rd District of Oklahoma. He chairs the Science, uh, 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 Science, Space, and Technology Committee, and he's committed to ensuring that the United States harness American innovation in energy efficiency and effectiveness, support research in basic science labs, improve access to STEM education while building the STEM workforce, and maintaining American global leadership in space exploration. Representative Lucas also serves on the Committees on Agriculture and Financial Services. My colleague Dan O will come up in just a moment and uh, we'll get a chance to hear what Representative Lucas has to say. Thank you. Hi, I'm Frank Lucas, Chairman of the Science, Space, and Technology Committee. And I want to thank the EESI for inviting me today to speak about geothermal energy, a topic of particular interest to myself and the Science Committee. All of you in attendance today know that advanced thermal technologies have the potential to transform the U.S. energy sector. Geothermal is no doubt a source of clean and renewable energy that is always on. Although the United States leads the world in geothermal power production, geothermal still contributes less than 1% of the total utility scale U.S. electric generation capacity. 
While I've seen the value of geothermal energy in my district with Oklahoma's thriving geothermal heat pumps industry, more work needs to be done to allow the rest of the country to access the full power of this resource. Federally funded research programs at the Department of Energy have a history of paving the way for industry innovation. That's why three years ago, the Science Committee worked to get my bill, the Advanced Geothermal Research and Development Act, signed into law as a part of the Bipartisan Energy Act of 2020. This legislation provided DOE with a comprehensive reauthorization of its geothermal technologies, R&D activities, directing DOE to partner with industry and academia to improve the next generation of geothermal energy systems. Meaningful collaboration between industry and agencies has been a priority of mine as chairman, and I'm grateful that organizations like the EESI that help facilitate good collaboration. Again, thank you all for inviting me to speak today. It's an honor to be a part of a conversation that will be fundamental to our nation's energy security. Spoiler alert, it's Representative hey. Deborah Ross. Uh, before I, turn to, before I introduce Representative Ross, I'd like to thank Repre uh, Representative Lucas and his great staff. We worked with his office a couple years ago on a uh, weather forecasting uh, briefing as well, and it's always really fun uh, to work with the folks on the Science Committee. And I'm really glad he mentioned the Energy Act of 2020. I feel like that's you know, often forgotten in, in the wake of the Infrastructure Bill and the Inflation Reduction Act, but it gave DOE a lot of uh, new authorities and improved a lot of uh, existing efforts there. So thanks for that mention, Representative Lucas. We're also gonna be hearing today from Representative Deborah Ross. Representative Ross is a civil rights advocate, a clean energy champion, a lawyer, and a proud North Carolinian. She is serving her second term representing North Carolina's second congressional district, which includes most of Wake County. Representative Ross serves on the House Committee on Space Science and Technology, the House Judiciary Committee, the House Ethics Committee, and the Select Subcommittee on the Coronavirus Pandemic. She is also a member of the House Democrats Leadership Team, serving as Chief Deputy Whip and on the Steering Committee uh, steering and policy committee. Thank you, Representative Ross, for joining us today, and we'll uh, hear what you have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Dan, for that kind introduction. And thank you to the Environmental and Energy Study Initiative and the Department of Energy for hosting this important discussion. My home state of North Carolina is all too familiar with the devastating effects of climate change. From increasingly frequent and severe hurricanes to extreme heat and wildfires, we're already experiencing the impacts of climate change. Clearly, we need to do more to combat the climate crisis and research and, and investment into clean energy solutions are some of the best options in our toolbox. And meeting DOE's Earthshots initiatives will require congressional support. It requires significant investments in research, development, and deployment of innovative clean energy technologies. I'm proud of the work that we've already done in Congress to help us meet our climate goals. I'm a firm believer that investing in clean energy technology is one of the best resources we have to combat climate change. In Congress, I've championed the development of North Carolina's offshore wind energy potential. My legislation to overturn the 10-year moratorium on offshore wind leasing off of the coast of North Carolina and other states in the Southeast was signed into law in the historic Inflation Reduction Act. My state has seen the ambitious goals for offshore wind energy and development. We've set them and we're on our way to meeting them. We'll continue to work to meet those goals as well as President Biden's ambitious national goals, including by harnessing the capabilities of floating offshore wind technology. The Floating Offshore Windshot Initiative is a crucial step toward shaping a sustainable and clean energy future. It seeks to reduce the cost of floating offshore wind energy by more than 70% by 2035. 
Achieving these goals will drive down energy costs for ratepayers, create thousands of jobs, and establish the U.S. as a leader in design, development, and manufacturing in a new industry. By harnessing the potential of offshore wind energy, the United States can be a leader in the global transition to a clean and sustainable energy future. This is just one of the Earthshot initiatives that will help us overcome any challenges to achieve our ambitious climate goals. Climate change is something that we cannot postpone, and the fight against it is one that we intend to win. So we need to start working today. We must invest in the research today to create the clean energy economy of tomorrow. I'm grateful to the Department of Energy for its work on this issue, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today. Thank you so much. And now I'll turn it over for remarks to Deputy Secretary of Energy, David Turk. Um, as Representative uh, Ross said, we are joined today by uh, a very special guest. David Turk is the Deputy Secretary of Energy. Uh, prior to his nomination as Deputy Secretary, David was the Deputy Executive Director of the International en Energy Agency, where he focused on helping countries around the world tackle their clean energy transitions. During the Obama-Biden administration, David coordinated international technology and clean energy efforts at the Department of Energy. And during this time, he helped spearhead the launch of Mission Innovation, a global effort to enhance clean energy innovation. David also served as Special Assistant to the President and Senior Director at the U.S. National Security Council. And earlier in his career, he worked in both the U.S. House and or U.S. Senate, and as the staff director of the National Security Subcommittee of the House Oversight Committee. It's my pleasure to welcome David Turk, the Deputy Secretary of Energy, to our briefing today. Thank you. Let me pick this up for you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dan. Thank you so much. Hey, everybody. Uh, let me just start, Dan, with a thank you to you and uh, all our staff from EESI for not only this briefing but all that you do to try to make sure. We're all informed by what's going on, and we can all improve and up our game uh, going forward. Certainly want to express a thanks to uh, uh, Chairman Lucas, uh, trying to get in there twice, but that's okay. <laughs> He's a chairman. Uh, if he wants to go twice, he can go twice. And to uh, Congresswoman Ross as well, and to uh, uh, Congressman Tonka and his staff for the room, just as Mike thanked uh, as well. And I want to thank you all. Uh, for not only coming here today, and hopefully you'll find this interesting. Uh, we've got a phenomenal panel, so I'm gonna try to keep my part <laughs> as short as possible, because I know you're gonna learn an awful lot from our panel, and happy to take some questions before I leave uh, as well. But I wanna thank you even more uh, importantly, and uh, more person to person for your public service. Uh, I had a chance, as Mike said, as Dan said, to um, uh, work here in the Senate and the House. In fact, I worked a couple floors down here in the Rayburn Building earlier in my career. And uh, I'm a big fan of public service, whether it's in the legislative branch, whether it's the executive branch, judicial branch, in government, local government, state government. Um, folks probably in this room could be earning a lot more, maybe working even less, and just appreciate your interest to try to be part of our democracy, part of our process to make laws to improve the way we're doing things going forward. So thank you for that uh, public service from uh, everyone here and those folks uh, virtually as well. Let me just give you a little bit of context uh, for the Earth Shots and what we're trying to, to do here. Um, we are making some progress on climate change, but we have to keep in mind about how uh, stark the math is and how much we have to do, right? Our president, rightfully so, in my opinion, has put on the table a net zero goal by 2050. Uh, 2050, for some of those who maybe are a little bit younger, seems like an awful long uh, time in the future for uh, others of us. Uh, maybe Dan and I had hair at some point, I think, when we were younger. Maybe that seemed like a long time. But that's 26 years. 26 years is not that long, certainly in the span of what we need to do in that 26 period uh, of time. Net zero means we not only have to clean up our electricity and get to net zero in electricity, that's the sector where we're making the most progress, not only domestically but internationally as well, but we also have to reduce and get to net zero in transportation. That's the highest sector for our emissions right now in the U.S. 
but it's not just electricity and transportation, it's industry, it's buildings, you name it, we've got to somehow get to net zero in a couple decade uh, period of time. So how are we doing? Uh, there is some good news out there. Our emissions in the U.S. actually went down last year, despite our GDP growing up. We are making significant progress. One of the most interesting pieces of analysis we did when I was part of the International Energy Agency is look across all sectors, all technologies, across all of these areas we need to get to net zero, and track which of those technologies are succeeding at a pace and a scale to get us to that net zero, to get us to that 1.5 degree trajectory. It ends up being 50 different technologies in 50 different uh, sectors. Right now, the latest numbers are that we are succeeding. We are doing enough at pace and scale in three of those 50 sectors. Now, three is a small number. I don't need to tell you all that. Uh, but these are significant technologies and significant areas where we are making progress. One of those is solar. Right now, in our country, 4% of our electricity uh, is produced by solar. Now, that is a small number, but uh, it used to be even smaller, and we've grown a huge amount just over the last few year period of time. We're also on a trajectory to get to 7% within just a couple years. 4% to 7% just in a couple years, that is the kind of scale of progress, scale of pace that we need to be successful, not just in solar, but across the board as well. One of those other three areas right now is EVs. We are seeing significant progress in penetration of EVs. In our own country, the latest numbers, month-on-month -month numbers, are one out of every 10 of our vehicles sold is an EV or a plug-in hybrid. That's quadruple from where we were when this president took over. So 10%, again, is not a huge amount in the grand scheme of things. We need to do an awful lot better and have our clean electricity grid in order to decarbonize transportation but going from very low quadrupling to 10% and then increasing even further, we are seeing some of that progress. But what do we need to do about the 47 areas? Lighting is the other one for those who are keeping track of the three of the 40, three of the 50. But what are we gonna do about the 47? What are we gonna do about all these other sectors and technology areas where we don't have the price competitiveness where we need to, where we don't have the pace and scale? The Bipartisan Infrastructure Legislation, the Inflation Reduction Act, and thanks for all of you who were part of those historic pieces of legislation are giving us a lot more tools in our tool belt to deploy, to build out these technologies in the real world as quickly as we can. But if we're gonna be successful to get to net zero in all of these sectors with all of the technologies we need to, we also need to double down or I'd say even triple down or quadruple down on innovation as well. There's an awful lot more we need to do in our laboratories, we need to do with private sector partners to reduce costs. And when I say reduce costs, I mean dramatically reduce costs. For solar, we had something uh, many years ago, actually not that many years ago, uh, about a decade or so, at the Department of Energy called SunShot. So we saw that solar's costs were decreasing, we saw the potential for solar to get to the kinds of penetration we're at now and we'll get to in the future but the costs weren't there. So we had a goal of reducing costs 75%. We reached that goal three years earlier than we set out to do originally. This was our EERE colleagues, of which Carolyn well knows and is a phenomenal leader in that part of our uh, department. So we can do this. The eight earth shots that we've launched now, they're part of a set, they're built off the SunShot model. It's dramatic cost reductions, it's dramatic numbers, they're purposefully bold. We need to be bold if we're gonna do what we need to do within this decade uh, period of time. You heard about a couple of them. I think there's hard copies of this. If not, it's certainly Googleable at our ERE website as part of our DOE. This is our Earth Shots, it lists all eight. A couple of them were already mentioned. Let me just pick up on a couple of those, in fact, the ones that were mentioned. Enhanced geothermal such a phenomenal resource, as the chair was mentioning. Enhanced geothermal means you don't just get to take advantage of geothermal when it's closer to the surface. You use the phenomenal drilling technology that we've developed in this country. You go deeper, you can do it anywhere if you go deep enough, and you just gotta make the costs work on it so that you have 24 seven power. If you can do it and get the economics to work, you have baseload power in a phenomenal way all across our country and all across the world. So our goal there is to reduce costs to $45 per megawatt hour. That's not where we're at now. That's about a 90% reduction. 
But again, we did it for solar. We can do it for enhanced geothermal. We can have that phenomenal resource if we put the investment, if we have the time and talent, work with the private sector going forward. Congresswoman Ross mentioned offshore wind, floating offshore wind in particular. We've got some areas of our coast where we can do traditional offshore wind. We're starting to build that capability out on the East Coast. But there are other parts where you actually have a better wind resource where it's deeper. And floating offshore wind is a phenomenal solution. But again, we've got to drive those costs to where we need to get to. So our floating offshore wind shot is drive down costs again to $45 per megawatt hour. That is a bold goal. That is not where we're at now. That now that's not even close to where we're at now, but we can drive those costs down even further. So these eight earth shots are meant to be bold. They're meant to put targets on the table. They're meant to put plans together. We use them internally in the Department of Energy, working with the rest of the government, working with the private sector to all rally around these goals, rally around these efforts, bring our time, talent, so that we can achieve these targets and we can have these as the tools in our tool belt to be successful uh, going forward. So it's everything from hydrogen, clean hydrogen, long duration energy storage. We need storage solutions for the longer term, right? 10 or more hours or even daily or weekly storage solutions at cost that allow our grids, that allow all our electricity system to make sense. Carbon negative shot, we need to have carbon removal technologies at scale at the price points where they're affordable in our country $100 per net metric ton. That's not where we're at right now with carbon negative technologies, but we can get there if we all lean in. Industrial heat, we need to have solutions for the harder to decarbonize sectors, including industry. This is a key part of it, is how do you have industrial heat that's not as greenhouse gas intensive as it is right now. Our goal there is to reduce greenhouse gas intensity 85% for carbon heat. Clean fuels and products shot, and our latest and most recent, our affordable home energy shot. A lot of these, of course, are not just saving our planet. That's good, that's necessary, but this is also about reducing costs for everybody, including folks who can least afford it. So this particular shot is aimed at reducing the cost of energy efficient retrofits in affordable homes by 50%. If we can achieve that, that is a big deal. Carolyn and her team have been working on that, among others, uh, going forward. So let me just leave you with this. To be successful on these earth shots, to be successful at getting to net zero is gonna require resources. Fuel in gets fuel out. If we wanna have the kind of uh, experts, expertise, the technology platforms, our laboratories, our facilities, we've gotta invest. We've gotta invest in that kind of resource. It's also going to, going to require an awful lot of partnerships, including and especially with the private sector and entrepreneurs. And we'll get into some great examples of our National Renewable Energy Lab working with partners in the private uh, sector. But it's also going to require, and I just want to leave you with this, uh, it's going to require an awful lot of people making career choices, whether you're in the congressional branch, the executive branch, at national labs, entrepreneurs, doubling down, getting excited about the opportunities, not being daunted by the challenges, taking that funding, taking those facilities, taking that research, and really driving things going forward. So again, thank you for the choices you've made so far. My hope is more and more people get excited about the clean energy space, make careers in it. We achieve these earth shots and we all succeed on these incredibly ambitious goals. All right, with that, let me leave it for uh, some questions. for that, uh, and we do have some time for questions. I don't know what you mean by the hair, though. This is by choice. I'm a huge Jason Statham fan. So maybe, I don't know, maybe it was just me. Um, but we do have some time for questions. So I'll look out in the audience. If I see a hand go up, I'll do my best to see you in the proper order. But perhaps to get us started, David, um, we're you know just barely the beginning of 2024, relatively early in the Earthshots initiative. Um, do you have any thoughts about where you would like to see ourselves, or the department, maybe in 2025, or maybe Yeah, so I think the thing to um, underscore and emphasize is uh, remember when we were all in school, some of us it may have been a little bit more recent and others it's been a little while, I'll speak for myself. <laughs> I'll speak for myself, uh, Dan, on that one. Um, 
there's a tendency sometimes uh, to procrastinate and wait to do the work until you get to the deadline. Um, there is no way we're going to be successful on net zero by 2050 or achieving any of these ambitious goals in the earth shots if we wait to provide the funding, if we wait to lean in on the ta talent, if we uh, wait for entrepreneurs to really jump into this area. So we need to front load everything because these are so ambitious, because these are so audacious goals on that front. So every day that goes by that we're not making tangible progress and we have metrics and we're tracking our progress to make sure we stay on track, to get on track, uh, uh, that's what we do at the Department of Energy. We're a bunch of nerds and data nerds and like really try to uh, keep ourselves focused on task. So what I'd like to see is us overachieving as quickly as we can, as early as we can, because these are so difficult. And any year that goes by that we're not making substantial progress on any of these, especially the cost reduction piece, is lost time, and we just don't have time to spare at all. Great, thanks. Um, I'll look out and see if I, if I see it again. I think we have a time for one or two more questions. Um, oh, here we go. Um, my colleague, Nicole, will be over. Hi, um, Siri Hedrina, a reporter with S&P Global. Um, if you're going to address this later, then apologies. But I guess any comment specifically on the progress on the hydrogen and carbon removal goals? Yeah, so the hydrogen goal, again, incredibly ambitious. Our goal for the hydrogen earth shot is to get down to a dollar per kilogram uh, through electrolysis. So this is the cleanest of hydrogen using renewables. Uh, that is not where we're at right now. We've got a lot of work to do on that front. What I think is particularly exciting about hydrogen right now in our country is, again, thanks to Congress and this president, uh, we've got a whole range of tools in our tool belt to get to that goal. So among other things, we at the Department of Energy have $7 billion right now going out to hydrogen hubs, seven hydrogen hubs across our country. That's a lot of money, and that's a great way to do hydrogen and bring the scale of economy that allows us to reduce costs at significant scale. Above and beyond that, we've got a billion additional dollar for a creative demand side uh, stimulator so that we have demand created so that supply of that clean hydrogen can match up, supply and demand working the economic side of things. Congress also gave us an additional $1.5 billion directly to work on electrolyzer costs. I was just out in California meeting with one of those electrolyzer companies right now, incredibly impressive what they're doing. And these are veterans, this particular company, veterans from solar industry for 15 years, folks who know the game, folks who know the industry, incredible technology and innovation going on in that space. But we've got that additional 1.5 billion. We also have, for the first time ever, a national hydrogen strategy in our country, not just a DOE strategy, a national strategy. And we have a national interagency task force we're working with the Department of Defense and Commerce and others who have important levers of their own. And we have an incredibly powerful tax incentive, the hydrogen production tax credit that's getting an awful lot of attention. We've got it out for notice. We want feedback to make sure that we get the most out of that tax incentive. Uh, that's up to $3 per kilogram of a tax incentive for the cleanest of hydrogen. So again, you put all that together, you're purposeful, you're intentional, you track. Uh, I think we have a very, very good chance of meeting that dollar per kilogram cost standard, cost, and hydrogen can be, it's called the Swiss Army knife of energy. It can be applicable for industry, heavy duty, uh, heavy uh, long haul trucking and uh, marine transport, other harder to decarbonize uh, sectors. So this is where I get excited, our team gets excited by all of these tools really leaning in. And thank you again to Congress for uh, giving us those tools. I'm Sierra Cato with Lewis Burke Associates. Um, I guess my question is, is the affordable housing earth shot the final earth shot or does DOE have plans to launch any additional earth shot? Yeah, so what we wanted to do, and it, it is the final earth shot, at least for this time period, what we wanted to do is not just have 80 different earth shots, right? Like we wanted to be very disciplined on those key areas where we really think we need to hone in and work. It doesn't mean that other technologies that I didn't mention that aren't part of the earth shots aren't important, but we wanted to be quite disciplined. 
so that we really could organize ourselves in DOE, work with folks in Congress to make sure we have the budgets that are able to really drive these key uh, technology areas. So now that we've got the eight and we've got what we consider a good cross-representation across the board, uh, this is the eight earth shots that we will be really engaging, working in, uh, and, uh, and talking about. Thank you very much. Um, I know you have to leave, so I hope uh, everyone will uh, treat you to one last round of applause. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. And thanks to everyone uh, on your team who helped uh, make this event happen. So much good work. Thank you. Must be a faster way to put these up. All right. Uh, well, thank you for that, uh, David. And thanks to everyone in our audience uh, for Staying with us now to hear the panel that David referred to. This is a tremendous, tremendous panel, and we are going to get into some of the specifics for these earth shots. And to kick us off is Carolyn Snyder. Uh, oh, actually, before I introduce Carolyn, I forgot one thing. We will have more time for questions. So uh, for folks in the room uh, who are able to stick with us through the presentations, you'll be once again welcome to uh, ask questions. We'll also be taking questions from our online audience. And so if you have questions for our panel and you're watching online, and I know there's a lot of you, you can send us an email, and the email address to use is ask, that's A-S-K, at EESI.org. And one last thing, sorry to delay your introduction, all of the presentation materials, all of uh, the information, all of it's on the front table, it's also all online. And if you'd like to go back and revisit any of the presentations you're about to see, you can do that by going to our website, which is EESI.org. And now, it is my pleasure to introduce Carolyn Snyder. Carolyn is the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Buildings and Industry at the Department of Agriculture. In this role, she leads offices that advance energy efficiency and reduce emissions from our nation's buildings and industry while supporting U.S. energy security and manufacturing competitiveness. Previously, Carolyn served as the director of the Environmental Protection Agency's Climate Protection Partnerships Division, where she led voluntary partnerships with thousands of industrial, commercial, utility, state, and local organizations. Carolyn, welcome to the briefing today. I'll turn it over to you. And if you'd like to bring your name card, I'll be happy to put mine down so everyone can see you. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I just want to echo the Deputy Secretary's thanks, Dan, to you and your amazing team, problem solving in real time, uh, for everything you do to, to help make sure we have data and scientific and informed decision making and conversations in our government, which is so essential for our functioning democracy. So thank you so much. Um, and I also want to echo thanks for all of you in the room joining us and joining us virtually for making the time today to learn more about what we, we feel is a very exciting portfolio of R&D happening to our country that really has the potential to be transformative. I'm going to talk today with a little bit more information about two of those earth shots and starting with our industrial heat shot. It was established to develop cost competitive industrial heat decarbonization technologies that can reduce greenhouse gas emissions by at least 85% from current technologies within 10 years. So why are we obsessed with uh, industrial heat, despite the fact that I think heat shot might be the most fun of the names? Um, well, first of all, in the US industrial sector is responsible for roughly a third of the nation's primary energy use and a little less than that of our energy related carbon dioxide emissions. And it's estimated that more than 60% of the technologies that we're going to be needing to reduce those emissions are not currently market ready. The technology innovation challenge is massive. And industrial heat is the largest single source of those emissions in the manufacturing sector. So roughly 11% of all US energy related emissions come from industrial process heat. But address addressing that challenge will be no easy feat. We have a diversity of processes and energy needs across US manufacturing, and industrial heat is a great example of that. Although pervasive and essential to so many manufacturing processes, for example, every major industrial subsector uses heat, but they use heat in different ways and at different temperatures, ranging here, as you can see on our graphic, from 300 degrees Celsius to over 800 degrees Celsius. Um, one of my favorite conversations with industries when they tell me, but Carolyn, you have to understand, I make volcanoes on site in my plant. How are we going to address that? And decarbonizing industrial heat will, as we've said, will be essential to meeting our 2050 climate targets. 
We estimate that our heat shot can put U.S. industrial sector on the path for potentially reducing 575 million metric tons of carbon equivalent emissions by 2050, which is equivalent to the current emissions from U.S. passenger vehicles each year. The OA identified three technology pathways that we think are possible for achieving this goal, and we're going to need innovations in each of these three. One, generating heat from clean electricity. Two, integrating heat from low emission sources. And three, innovating to find new low or new heat process technologies. I think of this pathway as entirely new ways of making things than how we make them today. Underpinning these three pathways are enabling technologies, materials, and systems that are essential to the success of all of this work, and in many ways, the work across all of our eight energy earth shots. Improving the efficiency of industrial processes will also allow for more specialized manufacturing on different scales, which in turn allows smaller factories to thrive, creating new job opportunities across our country, stimulating competition, and helping revitalize local economies. And as the Deputy Secretary mentioned, by leveraging these three pathways together, the industrial heat shot can also help deliver environmental and equity justice, energy justice benefits. Reducing the greenhouse gas emissions is one benefit of many of these technology innovations. They also reduce critical air pollution, and thus they improve the health of communities across our country that are living in proximity to manufacturing facilities. So, it's a massive challenge. What are we doing across the DOE and federal family? Well, it's an all hands on deck approach. As you can see, violating the font signed rules for my slide here. Um, but we're really pulling the full strength of federal government mobilized by this target. In our science and innovation portfolio at DOE, we created a new office solely focused on industrial efficiency and decarbonization. The Industrial Efficiency and Decarbonization Office, or IEDO, can't help the acronyms for short, provides now at DOE an expanded set of leadership and staff expertise that are focused in each of the major energy and emission intensive industries and the cross-cutting technology solutions like Process Heat requires. Across our R&D offices, and I already have this in my notes, a shout out to the 2020 Energy Act as well, um, we are leveraging the Technologies for Industrial Emissions Reduction Development Program that the agency was directed to create in, tw in the 2020 Energy Act to focus our close collaboration across DOE in this highly synchronized, all hands on deck approach to industrial R&D. What does that mean? Well, within AIDO, we have consolidated science and innovation investments in energy efficiency and electrification. With AIDO and the Office of Fossil Energy and Carbon Management, we partner closely for carbon capture and utilization investments. For the supply and utilization of low carbon fuels, feedstocks, and energy sources, we combine investments from bioenergy, hydrogen, solar, and nuclear. And our Office of Clean Energy Demonstrations is funding large-scale industrial demonstration projects as well. In addition, as I talked about that cross-cutting role, our Advanced Materials and Manufacturing Technologies Office and our Office of Science work closely together to make sure that we have those innovation in the materials and manufacturing processes that will be required for any of this to succeed. So what has DOE been up to? Well, DOE has already taken several key actions since the launch of this Earthshot to drive innovation against our goals. Last May, we launched EPIX, our seventh manufacturing USA Institute at DOE. It's led by Arizona State University, and the goal is to develop electrified industrial heating processes that support, as well as the related supporting technologies and the necessary skilled workforce. This institute aims to reduce manufacturing emissions by up to 60 million metric tons in 15 years. Last June, we announced over 10 projects related to de decarbonizing thermal processes with over $37 million of federal funding. And last September, our Office of Science announced $264 million for 29 projects in support of the Earthshots, including Energy Earthshot Research Centers and Science Foundation projects. Last October, our Office of Clean Energy Demonstrations announced the $7 billion for seven regional clean hydrogen hubs the deputy mentioned earlier. And just last month, AIDO announced over 15 projects related to decarbonizing thermal processes with over $50 million in federal funding. And we have two FOAs out on the street right now for 120, over $120 million in R&D funding and industrial efficiency and decarbonization. 
Our solar team continues to lead with concentrated solar, thermal, R&D, and Dr. Green will be speaking about some of our cross-DOE work on chemical feedstocks, where NREL has been a real leader as well. Our competitions across DOE continue to be oversubscribed, demonstrating the wealth of untapped American innovation and the continued hunger we're hearing from industry to partner with us on industrial R&D. So with that, I'm going to transition to a brief summary of our affordable home energy earthshot. While jobs, economic, and energy justice are central to executing all of our energy earth shots, this is a special one. It's the first shot where we're specifically targeting underserved communities from the very beginning. And it's launched as a partnership between our building technologies office at DOE and our office of economic impact and diversity, which is the first time we have that type of co-leadership for one of our shots. We call this energy earth shot equity centered and people first. And the reason I say that is that in our country, over one in five households are unable to pay their energy bill in full as of 2022. And black and indigenous and people of color households are more likely to face high energy burdens, energy insecurity, and adverse pollution and health impacts. For example, recent studies have found that asthma rates among black children in America are twice the national average. These trends disproportionately impact lower income residents who live more often in older homes that lack adequate insulation and energy efficient equipment. The, energy, the affordable home energy earthshot is a call to ensure that building decarbonization solutions can benefit all households, especially those struggling to meet basic energy needs. Why is the building sector important? Well, our nation's 130 million homes and buildings are responsible for consuming 40% of the nation's energy, nearly 75% of electricity. So when we talk about decarbonizing the electricity sector, we are inherently talking about the end use demand from buildings and an even greater share of peak electricity demand, and they account for roughly 30% of total greenhouse gas emissions. As outlined in our recently announced national blueprint for building decarbonization by 2050, to meet these goals, we require three core strategies. One, increase efficiency. Energy efficiency is more important than ever. Two, we need to accelerate the on-site emissions reductions that we have begun across our country. And three, we have to transform our investments in the grid edge so that we can reduce the electrical infrastructure costs being borne by ratepayers across our country. And we need to do all of that while increasing affordability, addressing resilience and health and safety challenges in our nation's homes and communities. On top of all of that, approximately 75% of today's homes will still be in operation in 2050. So this is not just a new construction conversation. This has to be a conversation of retrofitting millions of buildings a year. With that inspiration in mind, our affordable home energy earthshot focuses specifically on solutions to address the challenges of decarbonizing our affordable housing stock at that remarkable of a rate. And when I say affordable housing stock, we're talking about the roughly 50 million single family, multifamily, and manufactured homes across our country occupied by households that are earning less than 80% of mean income. Our investments are grounded in one simple truth. Every American deserves to live in a home with affordable, clean, and reliable power. Our goal is to make these cutting edge technologies so cheap that we can cut the cost of energy efficient retrofit packages by 50% while also lowering energy bills for residents of affordable housing by 20%, all within the next decade. So how are we gonna do this? Similar to each of our, many of our earth shots, there are multiple pathways of technology innovation to achieve this goal. Here you see a foundation of deep energy efficiency layered with efficient electrification and grid integration. What kind of technologies are we talking about here? Well, super insulated panels that you can put on the outside of your home, keeping you comfortable without major renovations compact heat pumps that are light and affordable, not requiring space adjustments or electrical infrastructure investments, and they are comfortable in any season. Smart controls that help residents save money without even noticing the changes to their consumption. And all together, these technologies delivering a whole home package to achieve these remarkable goals. These technologies can also improve the health and safety of our homes, and DOE is leading several R&D portfolios across this framework including efficient and low-cost HVAC with low and glo global warming potential refrigerants, geothermal heat pumps, 
our e-robot prize for reducing the cost of insulating ducts and walls, our easy prize for technology solutions to avoid electrical upgrades, including 120 volt heat pumps, heat pump water heaters, and smart breaker and smart panel technologies. And I just wanna do one last example, which is our buildings upgrade prize, where we're fostering seeds of innovation in 45 communities across our country to develop innovation in building retrofits through more than $22 million in cash prizes and technical assistance. So lastly, I just wanna put an offer out to all of you. We want to engage with your organizations, with members in your districts, to have their challenges, their successes, be how we prioritize our investments in these, both of these portfolios. So please let us know if you're interested in being involved in our strategy and roadmapping discussions. I hope, as you can see from my remarks today, you know, from large industrial facilities to manufactured housing in rural communities, we're leveraging these earth shots to marshal the full power of American innovation from the private sector, from our brain trust in the national labs and universities to develop solutions that work for every American communities and companies. So thank you so much. And again, thanks for including me today. Such a great presentation. And I'm glad that you have the brain trust because when you said volcanoes, I was like, oh, vinegar and baking soda. I could, I could figure that out. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. Um, this is a probably a good moment. We, we had David, we have Carolyn. There's actually a lot of DOE folks in the audience today. Maybe they could just raise their hands a little bit. If congressional staff want to take a moment to maybe to chat with them a little bit after uh, the briefing today, they are uh, tremendous resources. And you mentioned Building Technologies Office. Uh, we had Mandy Mahoney at one of our expo panels last year. I think we were her first speaking engagement after she took the job, which was always really, really fun. Um, that brings us to our second panelist today. Uh, Nidhi Takar is Vice President of Policy and Regulatory at Forum Energy. In this role, she for, uh, leads Forum's global policy and regulatory strategy to develop markets for multi-day energy storage. Before this, Nidhi was Senior Director of Resource and Regulatory Strategy and Engagement for Portland General Electric. She also served in the administration of California Governor Jerry Brown. And during the Obama-Biden administration, she was the senior advisor to the U.S. Department of Energy's Loan Program Office. Welcome to the briefing today. I will make way for your name tent, and uh, your slides are already teed up, so take it away. Thank you so much. Okay, good afternoon, and thanks for sticking with us here. This has been a fantastic discussion to date. Um, I do want to start with my own thank you, because I have to say, as a prior congressional staffer, who used to report into Cannon House office building almost 20 years ago. It's always fun to come back to the Hill. Um, and I wanna thank you for taking the time to be here with us today. I know you have extremely busy schedules and so carving out that time um, for an educational deep dive is always challenging, but uh, we really appreciate it. Um, and I would like to just hope that by the end of my presentation today, you all have a good sense of what is long duration energy storage. Um, and you see the value of multi-day storage or long duration storage, as well as the opportunities that lie before us. And frankly, you know, what it means to be a company looking to transform the electric grid using multi-day storage in the United States um, with an America first approach. So an American company um, with an American, American manufactured product that is going to increase American grid reliability, resiliency, and energy security. So I'll start here with a little overview of who Form Energy is. Um, so I mentioned that we are currently manufacturing a um, novel 100 hour iron air battery used strictly for grid scale storage. It's not for electrification of vehicles. Um, the technology doesn't quite uh, work in that context. I'll tell you a little bit more about that. Um, we currently have four offices. We're about 700 employees now. We um, do most of our R&D work in Somerville, Massachusetts. Um, in California and Berkeley, we do our battery engineering work. We're currently doing pilot manufacturing by hand in 84 Pennsylvania, which is right outside of Pittsburgh. That um, work is being scaled up in Weirton, West Virginia in our inaugural battery manufacturing plant that's currently under construction. Um, and we'll be doing high volume manufacturing at that plant, um, initially 50 megawatts, and by when that plant is built out to full capacity, 500 megawatts a year. 
we actually just broke ground at that manufacturing site last Memorial Day weekend. I'm really excited to say that the plant itself is almost fully constructed. Um, the core and shell is done. We're starting to put the finishing touches on the building and we're gonna start landing equipment in that manufacturing plant, hopefully by next month. Um, Secretary Granholm was uh, uh, at our groundbreaking ceremony. We were very delighted to have her along with uh, representatives from the West Virginia delegation in the governor's office, um, Senator Manchin as well, um, and Senator Capito, who um, was also uh, also a part of the success. Um, our investors, we've had 820 million to date invested in the company, and that number is really up there, I think, for a couple of reasons. The first is to let you know that you know this 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 is. Um, an illustration of investor confidence in not just Form Energy, but the technology and the use case for multi-day storage and long duration storage in the United States and globally, frankly, um, because we really haven't charted that path even globally. Um, it also, I think, is a testament to how much money does it really take to scale up a first of a kind technology and to do manufacturing of that first of a kind technology. I think building some of the largest infrastructure projects we've had in the United States for uh, decarbonized um, energy, you know, it's very cost intensive. And then when you sort of add another layer of manufacturing on top of that, very capital uh, intensive um, from that standpoint. And then the last is just, we have a tremendous amount of experience at the company, um, not just at our executive level, but down to um, every level of the team. And it's a real impressive bunch of, um, of minds that have come together to solve this really hard challenge we have. So what is the challenge? Um, I think we all know that fundamentally the electric grid is in this very dynamic environment. Uh, it has to transform to meet tomorrow's uh, challenges and frankly even today's challenges and that's everything from concerns around um, a lack of electricity on the grid to a lack of transmission and um, you know, uh, dealing with aging infrastructure, um, as well as trying to think about what this energy transition looks like and how do you do that in a way that's gonna be affordable, cost-effective, ensure reliability on the grid. Um, we talked a little bit about uh, weather today. Weather modeling came up, I think, a couple times, and as we all have all experienced in this room, we're seeing changing weather patterns and these weather patterns have become very disruptive to our grid. Um, we also are seeing power supply becoming much tighter. I think if you've seen any of the power markets in Texas and in the Pacific Northwest and in the West in particular, um, you've seen exacerbated prices, $1,000 per megawatt hour for electricity. Ultimately, the customer pays for that, right? Like a, a rate payer uh, pays for that. And so um, we're seeing that we're having just reduce in and we're having an increase for electricity and the need um, for frankly more electrons as we look to electrify our grid and we're having a reduced power supply for a number of reasons uh, also we're seeing more of an influx of wind and solar in particular um, on the grid and with that comes the need to firm up those resources so you have more consistent supplies of generation and then finally i mentioned transmission um, we have an aging transmission grid in the United States. Uh, we have, you know, um, concerns around just a uh, lack of transmission, uh, as well as the fact that some of that transmission is um, pretty old and needs a refresh. So uh, taking this back to why we're here, here today um, from the uh, long duration storage shot angle. So the long duration storage shot is, um, has the target of reducing the cost of grid scale storage by 90% for systems that deliver 10 plus hours of duration within the decade. And why is, why is this important? Why does energy storage matter? Why does long duration storage matter? Uh, the reality is, is um, energy storage is critical to decarbonized reliability. Without storage, we can't firm up those clean energy resources I mentioned, such as wind and solar. When the wind isn't blowing and the sun isn't shining, you know, the question becomes, well, what do you do in those situations? And then the flip side of that is when the, when the wind is blowing a lot and the sun is shining a lot, what do you do when you have excess energy? Right now, there's really no place to put that excess energy other than short duration storage, like lithium ion batteries, 
that are on the grill, grid and they can help with sort of those two to six hour um, peaks and valleys that we see in our electric grid. Uh, but we don't really have another option as you get further um, along that trajectory and are looking to uh, address wind lulls or solar lulls of 24 plus hours or having, you know, again, excess electricity. Um, so I think what's interesting about this long duration storage shot too is there's an opportunity to really commercialize an innovative technology through this process, but I think it's not just about commercializing a technology and American innovation, it's about what it means um, more holistically for the United States. And I mentioned American energy independence, which I think the war in Ukraine has highlighted for us um, a real critical need to address those vulnerabilities. I think uh, through COVID we saw concerns around supply chain and I think the more we're able to onshore American manufacturing, um, that helps reduce the vulnerabilities around um, some of the supply chain risk we see that can feed into our energy security. And so I think while it's important to think about decarbonized reliability, we also really need to be thinking about these issues from the angle of American energy independence and security. So this next slide just really gives you, I think, the value case for long duration storage or multi-day storage. I mentioned that we already have like a well-established class of short duration storage. That's batteries, that's pumped hydro, um, flywheel technologies. Those technologies have existed for a long time. We have proof of concept um, deployed nationally in many, many places. And we're now seeing um, a push and interest towards this uh, period of, I would say, 10 to 160 hours as noted in this chart, um, with a predominant focus on like the 36 hours to 160 hour portion of that, that um, light green band you see there. We have some uh, companies on the market right now who have commercialized technologies of 10 to 12 hours, I would say roughly, and I would probably put them within sort of the, the um, midday storage camp or interday storage camp. Um, but again, thinking about multi-day storage, long duration storage, that's an entirely new technology class, an entirely new energy sector. Um, and the Form 100 hour iron air battery is just one example of um, a technology that could fall within that class. We talked a little bit about hydrogen. Hydrogen storage could be one of those other technologies. Um, I would say that we are probably one of the farthest companies along in commercializing a technology uh, in the multi-day storage sector. Okay, so this is a little bit about the iron air battery that we're commercializing. Um, so effectively what we are doing is rusting and unrusting a battery. And the interesting thing about um, iron air batteries is there, this is not a new battery chemistry. Um, back in the 70s, Westinghouse received a grant through the Department of Energy to study iron air batteries. And the use case was electric vehicles. Um, folks found that naturally an iron air battery is too heavy for transportation, hence, why we are now thinking about it in the context of grid scale storage. So the five co-founders of Form Energy, um, many of them had worked in the sector before, actually all of them, excuse me, had worked in the sector before and their focus had been on short duration technologies. And they were left with the question of what do we do uh, in these situations where we don't have the wind blowing and the sun shining for extended periods and how do we think about long duration technologies? And that was the, the challenge that they went out to solve and they tried a number of battery chemistries and ended up landing on iron air because it is uh, highly cost effective, um, very scalable. Iron is the second most mined commodity globally. And um, uh, unlike lithium ion, you don't have a concern with thermal runaway or dendrites that form and flammability. So again, that goes to the, the safety of it. This is a little bit of a, a picture just to give you a visualization of what the form battery will look like when it's deployed in the field. We have a cell, the smallest functional unit of the battery on the left, and if you look all the way to the right, you have what a system looks like. That's essentially multiple 40-foot shipping containers that contain um, batteries within the enclosures. I'm gonna just fast forward here a little bit more. 
I'm going to jump over to our commercial scale manufacturing that we have going on in Wharton, West Virginia. Um, this is a really impressive story. I, I spoke about our manufacturing that we're standing up there. It's high volume manufacturing. Um, 750 jobs are going to come out of building our first phase of this factory. So I think that gives you a sense of what it means to be able to onshore American manufacturing in the United States. Uh, what it, you know, I, I sort of really think we're at this, this inflection point where we're seeing a reindustrialization in the United States. And this, this to me, this picture signifies bringing um, energy security, decarbonized reliability, and American manufacturing and innovation all together. And lastly, um, these are, this is just a, a slide with some of our commercial partners. And I think this one, this slide in particular is important because it highlights the confidence that utilities have in our technology and their desire and willingness to deploy a 100 hour battery in their energy systems. Um, the, we discussed the bipartisan infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act today, and I would just say that I think those tools noted by the Deputy Secretary are very critical to stay in place. They are going to be um, and already are accelerating commercialization of critical innovative technologies and also increasing affordability. And we've talked about affordability a couple times today, and I, I do think ultimately that's where the rubber meets the road here. And um, our customers are going to be deploying a 100-hour Iron Air battery their regulators have to agree that that battery makes sense uh, for the customers to pay for at the end of the day, um, and that there's benefit to the electric grid for um, uh, deploying a first-of-a-kind innovative technology. And so that sort of brings the idea of getting from R&D to commercialization and then deployment vis-a-vis -vis investor-owned utilities, publicly-owned utilities, um, and uh, and you know, being a consumer of what that looks like at the end of the day. Look forward to your questions later. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, is it all right if I, I would kind of like to back up. On your slide here, you have the, the new construction happening, but then there's that older building, and I'm pretty sure I've seen a version of this photo that kind of superimposes what was there before and what's there now. Could you just maybe comment just for a moment about this site and sure. what the site means? To sure, uh, I'd be happy to. This site is extremely rich in cultural heritage. It is the old Weirton steel mill site. Um, the steel mill at one point uh, employed about 13,000 people. Now the city of Weirton is about 12,000. That gives you a sense of the scale of employment. Um, that employment was lost about 50 years ago when they tore down the steel mill site. And it, this is one of the shuttered areas in the United States that I think many of you are, are familiar with where we had the heyday of industrialization in the United States and then we've seen that dwindle and it's exciting to be able to bring back um, that hope and that prosperity to a community. The folks in Weirton have been incredible. Uh, frankly, in the entire northern panhandle of West Virginia have just been uh, very welcoming. Um, that building in particular is the Open Hearth Building uh, that you see over here on the, um, I guess for you, the right side. That's the <laughs> last standing building on the Weirton Steel Mill site. We've decided to keep it and we're hoping to repurpose it as part of the uh, larger plant. I don't, it, it won't be used in manufacturing operations. It'll probably just be like a you know, an open air pavilion, but we felt like it was important to try to keep a piece of it. Could be a really long, like, curling place, yes, right? That's Wherever right. that's called the rink, I guess. Very long rink. bowling alley. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. And um, uh, it's always nice to be able to go back and look at people's slides. And if you'd like to, you can do that by visiting us online at www.esi.org. And if you want to go back uh, and watch any of our presentations. And as a reminder, we will have some questions at the end. So if you're in the room, Start getting them ready. Uh, we'll do as, uh, our best to get to as many as possible. And if you're online, you can send us an email to ask, that's ASK at ESI.org. Our third panelist today is Peter Green. Peter is the Deputy Laboratory Director for Science and Technology and the Chief Research Officer for the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. Peter began his career at Sandia National Laboratories, where he spent a decade and subsequently two decades on the faculties of the University of Texas, Austin, and the University of Michigan. Peter is a former president of the Materials Research Society and is a member of the National Academy of Engineering. Peter, welcome to the briefing today. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Dan, and thank you for the invitation. I'm delighted to be here, and I'd also like to thank you 
um, for attending. Um, so you heard three presentations and they provide a really fantastic basis for what, what I'm about to share with you. I'm, I'm also going to reemphasize a few things. And perhaps a big message, um, the way to think about earth shots, right? The earth shots represent grand challenges that need to be addressed if we're to achieve net zero emissions. They were formed and managed by DOE working with other agencies, working with the 17 national labs, and indeed academics and industry. The, suc the success is gonna rely greatly on collaboration between the above. They were defined um, based on very deep analysis, techno-economic techno analysis, financial analysis, also looking at scenarios of systems. So it, it was not a trivial undertaking, it is major and evolving. So maybe that's one of the most important th messages I'd like you to leave with. I'm from Enrel, the blue dot, so we're, we're in Colorado, in Golden. And um, the lab was actually formed in 1977. That was just after the energy crisis of the 70s. And we worked on solar energy, first solar lab. And the lab did not only very basic research, but it also connected with industry to show its worth. It ran a risk of being shut down if we couldn't do that. So that's really set the DNA of the lab. Um, if you look at solar, silicon being a dominant technology, um, the most efficient solar cells in the world right now, the multi-junction solar cells, that came from Enrel. The largest thin film, thin film solar manufacturer in the US is first solar. Cadman tell you right, that essentially is work that was, that, that, that organization um, was really founded based on collaborations with Enrid, and still today we do a lot of very basic research for them, as long as foundational research to enable the work that they do. Just a few brief words about Enrel. We're about 3,700 employees approximately, and we publish around 1,200 papers. All these are technical reports, some of these are scientific papers, collaborating with university and industry um, virtually everywhere. In addition to solo, we're actually work research on wind. The first um, modern day design of wind blades, that came from Enrel working with industry, as an example. The next generation of wind blades are gonna be thermoplastics. That, again, something led by Enrel working with industry and academia um, for the most part. We have over a thousand active partnerships, working with a remote village in extreme weather environments and limited resources, like in Alaska. Um, to the city of LA working with communities to help LA understand how can they achieve 100% renewable um, power. On the other end, we're working with um, companies like IBM and, um, and Microsoft and Google to Exxon and Shell. This transition involves work and contributions from everybody in that sense. I want to share this with you, right? If you, if you look at, for example, 1980 until today, uh, there have been a no large number of billion dollar extreme weather events, droughts, floods, things like that. And the damage is a, has been estimated to about, be over two trillion dollars. The point here is that we're seeing more extreme weather events and they're more frequent. Today, scientists can tell, there's an article in physics today, can tell basically which extreme weather events are associated with the work of humans. So we're having a lot more insight in what's going on. What is this telling us? The power grid's got to improve. We need something that's more resilient, for sure. Uh, we we'll look at how we, we produce um, things like fertilizer from ammonia, which basically now feeds half the global population. That's heavily intensive in terms of energy and GHG emissions, um, concrete, asphalt. My point here is that we need to find ways that are less energy intensive and in such a way that we're not going to be emitting as much. So new processes, new chemical processes, or biological processes that are being discussed right now, thinking of. Um, I, I pick on plastics, right? We began making plastics in the 50s. And the weight of plastics that we've literally produced is more than the weight of all humans on the planet. This is an example. So we need to find ways of um, making plastics rather than a petroleum road. We need to think of ways to upgrade and upcycle plastics and making new things. A lot of ideas out there, <laughs> right? We're gonna take advantage of a lot of the advances we've made over the last century as we began to build a wonderful economy globally based on fossil fuels. So we need to think outside the box going forward. So really then, we, we need to be thinking about a new energy system. And just by way of context, the current system, right, we generate power centrally and we simply distribute. Now we're looking at the way we're using energy to meet the needs of customers and it's more distributed. You know, we got rooftop solar, we got uh, wind, things like that. 
we are having a, collecting a lot more data about how we're using Angit, providing better support for customers. Eventually, we're going to make a grid that's going to be um, autonomous. And I want to highlight the grid, the grid modernization initiative, which began um, even prior to the current and even before the Trump administration, where GOE was actually funding this. What is this new grid going to look like? How is it going to be um, optimized? How does it pr provide needs for customers? How is it going to be cost effective to ensure that um, it remains economical. So that work's going on. And it's a, it's a collaboration between many of the national labs, industry, and academics. So that's, happened, that's been happening for some time. Here's a nice graphic. So the idea as we think about decarbonizing is something like transportation. You start off, you get electrons from a renewable source, wind or solar, what have you. That can provide power for an electrolyzer to make hydrogen. The hydrogen you produce you can actually capture CO2, which we're doing right now, and react, you can actually make new chemicals. You can make chemicals just like you can in petroleum road. You can make materials, yes, and you can make fuels, synthetic fuels, for, um, for, um, for, um, for rail or for airplanes or what have you. So the blueprints there, what it has to be done at scale and cost. That's where the big challenges lie. And there's a lot of research to be done. And hence the Earthshot provides, uh, articulates what these challenges looks like and where we're going. Now, Getting back to the way the earth shots are going, I'm going to give you a sense of how you might think about them, right? So you have a power generation, you want to decarbonize the power generation, right? So we're going to go primarily renewables. What it means then, for example, geothermal, we heard about geothermal earlier. So you want to, if you want to get to geothermal providing something in the order of 8.5% of um, primary power to the U.S., you have to beat the earth shot, okay? Offshore wind is the other one. You're going to have to produce about a little over a terawatt of wind in a few years. It cannot be done without offshore wind. And that's where you're going to have to think about basically designing systems that are going to work offshore in deep waters. It's a big, big challenge requiring lots of, lots of things. We just heard about long duration storage for the grid. That becomes important. Um, we also heard um, from Assistant Secretary Carolyn uh, about affordable home energy and industrial heat. So that also follows as you're trying to decarbonize the production of things like steel, as an example, come through. And then the last part, we're thinking about clean fuels, as you basically want to get away from fossil-based fuels to making fuels synthetically or other, other ways or from biomass, so you reduce the greenhouse gas emissions. So the point then is that these earth shots really reflect things that we have some insight into how to do, but getting there is going to be a highly collaborative process. This is going to be expensive, and yes, we're doing it so we, we can actually survive. Uh, as I showed you, the extreme weather events are just getting more and more severe. We don't know where it's going to stop if we don't do something, right? Um, so the offshore wind I mentioned, I want to share that with you. So there's this image of things. You like to be able to simulate very carefully before you build things to understand what the challenges look like. As of a few weeks ago, we've developed an exascale computing system. It's at Oak Ridge National Labs. This is the era has arrived. And, and but right now, we can do much more realistic simulations of looking at the, uh, the performance of wind machines, or the interactions with the atmosphere. We don't know much about that, by the way. Or the interactions are or sitting on, on a sea where you have all these buoyancy forces playing out. We don't know, quite frankly, how to deal with this. The simulations give us a lot of insight into how that happens. And it's highly collaborated between the labs, a lot of universities, and industry, by the way. I want to say something about hydrogen. Most of the hydrogen we use today is actually, actually comes from fossil fuels, right? The steam methane reforming. Pretty, pretty, pretty bad stuff with a lot of emissions. And hydrogen is already very important, right? We use it a lot. We use it, for example, to make um, ammonia, and then ammonia for fertilizer, or methanol, or we use it for refining, petroleum, all kinds of things that are metals. And in the future, we heard this is going to be really important for trying to uh, for grid stability. It's going to be a key part of how, how we do things as we look at conversion from chemical to electrical energy, uh, as well as providing feedstocks. So we can't rely on this fossil-based generation alone. Maybe carbon capture can help, but electrolysis is going to be a key part of it. This is how you get clean hydrogen, essentially. But the issue getting back there is cost. But if you look at all the examples over there in terms of applications, we, you begin to get some insight into, you know, from, um, from production of um, fuels and um, chemicals all the way to transportation. Trains, <laughs> that's another example in Europe. Uh, forklifts uh, in warehouses. These are um, huge applications to think about. 
Um, I show a picture of a wind machine outside, a wind, uh, wind turbine and wind machine, same thing. I never say windmill, <laughs> all right? Where out at sea, the resource, as uh, Deputy, Deputy Turk mentioned, is huge, and its constant is much better than land, and that's one of the reasons we want to do that. And so you can actually produce hydrogen provide you once you get power from the wind to do that. So lots of people are thinking about this. The challenge now is the cost, and um, this is a bit, um, just look at the green region, is basically the cost of, of, um, of, of electricity. It's high, you want to get it cheaper. Even though electricity from wind and solar is comparable to fossil, it, it's going to get cheaper. The other aspect of it um, is, is, is the capital cost. There's a lot of research on electrolyzers to do this. Electrolyzers aren't all the world over a century old, but there wasn't much research done on them, now we're doing it, so there's a lot of progress to be made. And I really want to emphasize that. Um, people are pretty enthusiastic. The bipartisan and infra infra infrastructure law has a billion dollars invested in working on electrolyzers, and indeed, the Inflation Reduction Act provides tax incentives to people. Right. All right, uh, I'm giving the hook. This is just a picture of all the interaction between all the labs and things going on. Um, this last thing I want to mention, clean fuels. You can take biomass and you can convert this, convert this to molecules and chemicals and fuels. We know how to do that. And you can also, you, if you, you can capture CO2, direct air capture, or from uh, industrial processes and convert that with hydrogen to chemicals and, uh, and materials. Uh, this is just a graphic of that. And let me, my final remark I want to make to you is that this challenge is not just a scientific and technical, technological advance. It's not just that. It relies on the government investments. It relies on really smart policies. So even these policies from the IRA were actually developed based on very, very deep analysis to guide you in terms of if you make an investment, what's going to potentially happen. We know it's working, or they know it's working. <laughs> That's the key thing. And then finally, implementation. You want to make sure you work in communities and you're doing something that makes sense to them. You can't just take a wind turbine and put it in a community and say it's going to work. You've got to spend time. We actually do that. Live with the community and understand what it is that they need. Develop an analysis with them collectively, collaboratively, and then go back and implement. We even go so far as making digital twins of a system and we're sitting down with people to understand how it's going to work. And so unless everybody's involved in this transition, it's not going to work. Unless everybody benefits from it, it's not going to work. All right, so with this, let me thank you. All right, we are going to transition to questions. And we're go we'll go a little bit past because we started a couple minutes late. But um, I'm going to look out in the audience. And if I see you, I, my colleague Nicole will bring over um, the microphone. Um, looking, I'm going to get us started. Um, and I think I'd like to ask a question. Maybe, Carolyn, we can start with you and, and then go down through the panel. Um, you know, eight earth shots, that seems to be the right number for now, right? David was talking about really focusing and being disciplined. Do you have any thoughts about what might s some benefits of DOE working on eight simultaneously? Are there things that maybe are happening in one earth shot that might be informing the work in the other earth shots? And um, love to hear a little bit uh, sort of about what the advantage of maybe trying to make progress on aid at the same time might be. Yeah, thank you for that. I, I think Peter did a great job mapping out how, mm -hmm. how many of these earth shots relate with each other. And the Deputy Secretary referenced how there was robust analytical um, investment in deciding on what those earth shots are. And it's a challenge, right? It's really demotivating to say you have to do everything at once. Um, but it is a complicated set of challenges we face. And so one earth shot wasn't the right amount but finding ones that really could help mobilize us to big, bold targets where we aren't, where we're lagging mm -hmm. um, in a way that are coordinated with each other. And I, I think you, you've seen that both in our private sector work and in our work with national labs and universities that we are connecting those dots where appropriate. Um, I, I come to things from an end use sector perspective. Um, so you heard me talk about the industrial earth shot, the homes earth shot, you know, we come from that perspective United States industry is not saying like, I want just this or shot. We need to solve the problems they're facing in their manufacturing facility. And that's gonna require a set of solutions. And we think this is the right portfolio to make sure that we're working on those innovations that are required. Thanks. Um, Nidhi, please go ahead. Sure. Um, what Carolyn said, and I would also just add to that, um, I think thinking about these eight earth shots together helps you better understand 
the kind of market you're trying to move overall and the goals you're trying to implement when you're looking to have decarbonized reliability, how you think about what that um, trajectory to commercialization looks like. Peter's last slide um, was really, I think, a great de depiction on all the tools in the toolbox needed to get past um, from R&D to commercialization and for those technologies to have to navigate that valley of death um, through that process. And so I think um, overall having that intersectionality of resources really gives you um, the benefit of a holistic uh, planning tool. That's right, and just to complement what everybody said, um, there's research happening in a lot of areas and a lot of places at some time. What the Earth Shots have done is really help us to understand what a real challenge looks like so we can actually bring a lot of diverse ideas together to address them. So in that sense, I thought it was a sort of a brilliant move on the part of DOE to help people understand where the work that they're doing can fit into things, um, for oftentimes for people who didn't know, as, as an example, and then providing some investments and incentives to address them. Without that, um, we were sort of rudderless trying to get to 2050. Great, thanks. I'm looking for our questions. Um, I have another one. I have lots of them. I have a whole page of them. Um, Nini, maybe we could start with you for this one, since you're kind of the private sector representative today. Um, I think it's really cool the way the panel came together. We have lots of voices and um, featuring obviously lots of work at DOE in the labs, but you know we wouldn't be able to, you know, DOE sort of starts this stuff, but really it's the private sector that will ultimately commercialize it. What are some additional partners that you're looking around the long duration energy storage space and, and eager to work with? And what, what can some of those partners bring to bear um, to help the LDS uh, uh, Earthshot become a, you know, a reality and maybe even a reality at the um, sort of accelerated time frame that David was referencing? Yeah, well, I definitely think um, engagement from the federal agencies is absolutely critical. You know, I think we're asking um, the private sector to be really bold at this point in time with the unprecedented uh, level of incentives that are available from Bill and IRA. And we have partners with the federal agencies in helping us be bold, but also need them to continue to be bold on modeling and metrics and how you think about how all these technologies fit into the grid. Um, and then I'd also say the state um, regulators and sort of state legislators and state agencies, state energy offices are absolutely critical mm -hmm. in that deployment curve and um, the adoption of first of a kind technologies. Even when you go to commercialize a technology, and I, I sort of wear my loan programs hat when I say this, um, you know, the reality is, is you have to have offtake. You have to have someone who wants to purchase whatever you're producing, whether it's on the manufacturing side or on the clean energy side um, from like a solar project or a wind project. And that doesn't happen without the support of regulators who ultimately approve or disapprove whether a utility is going to be able to purchase um, that uh, you know, type of electricity or whatever kind of resource is being uh, procured. And I'll say this one more time, all of this goes hand in hand with affordability uh, for a customer at the end of the day. So it's all part of this larger kind of, um, I would say, uh, I wanna say it's almost like a, a, a wheel here of innovation that we have. Okay. Peter, from where you're sitting at NREL, what are some additional stakeholders that you're kind well, of eager to bring into the fold? Yeah, that's an that's a excellent question. So remember, it, long duration storage, the current storage for grid is lithium ion batteries. And we're trying to get to a fraction of the cost of lithium ion batteries. So it's going to be looking at technologies way be beyond batteries, um, thermal storage. Um, I think on the Carolyn's portfolio, for example, there's a lot of work going on in there. And indeed, it's, it's bringing um, work collaborators and people from all different directions to address there, li literally. Yeah, great. Um, Carolyn, if you have anything you'd like to um, comment on, that'd be great. Yeah, two, two quick additions. Um, I would say making sure that our research priorities are informed by the challenges being faced on the ground in the communities we're trying to serve. And I think the affordable home energy shot is, an, is, is a, state, a bold statement for us of really flipping the prioritization of how we approach in, uh, technology investment in buildings. We are starting with multifamily manufactured housing, old and more challenging footprints, not higher end, more expensive new construction buildings. Um, is one, and then I'd also just do a plus one on Nidhi's point about state regulatory environments. As you saw with Peter's graphics, 
the electricity, the flow of electrons is how a lot of these technologies are going to be interacting. And a lot of that's happening in a distribution system whose planning is fragmented across our country. And as someone who started in public service um, for the state of Delaware in a small state, the challenge is to bring the kind of analytics and science-informed decision-making for the massive interactions and transformations we're seeing in our grid is it, those are hard challenges and one where we've been working with the National Lab colleagues around how do we give better decision support resources. Every state has different priorities, but how can we be more helpful that they're achieving their goals? Um, because it's remarkable the amount of transformations happening in our power sector at the same time. And analysis from our National Labs show, you know, if you get that on the more right end, more societally efficient way, you can save on the order of hundreds of billions a year in electrical infrastructure costs, which is real money that could be going into other public priorities. Great, thanks. Um, maybe I'd like to end with just a quick, maybe we'll treat this one as a lightning round, because um, I think, um, Peter, perhaps we could start with you, and then we could hear from Carolyn, and then, so we're not always ending and starting with the same person. Um, Peter, let's pretend we're back here February 1st, 2025. Uh, what would you like to say about the progress that Earthshots have made uh, over the course of the next 12 months or so? Oh, Peter, could you turn your mic on? Sorry. No, that's okay. Yeah, there's a roadmap that's been implemented for each of the, of the, of the um, earth shots. Mm -hmm. And um, I would be comfortable if we're on track. That, that would be my biggest wish. Uh, right now, at least in the early stage. <laughs> Great, thanks. Karen? I would say a, a shared sense of urgency, as you heard from the Deputy Secretary, every year that goes by, that's the cost of inaction that makes it that much harder to achieve our shared goals. So I want private capital, public capital, and the best minds across our country mobilized to work on these challenges. Great. Nidhi, I think this means you have the last word today. Okay, and I'll take that one step further and say one year out and five years out, uh, that that. Earth shots are working. The cost curve is coming down. We are seeing more steel in the ground. Technologies are being deployed um, that are forcing that cost curve to come down. And through that, you have public sector support, whether it's through debt or capital, that's helping bring that cost curve down in conjunction with private um, capital. And um, uh, better, better modeling and metrics, I'm going to put a plug in for this again, because all of these technologies require a good way to measure them mm -hmm. to ensure they're working in the right way and we're valuing them in the correct way for ultimately energy markets and um, utilities and other uh, entities who will be embracing these technologies. Great. Well, thank you very much. Um, we're going to have to wrap it there because they're starting to get ready for the next event. <laughs> I saw a garbage can appear in the back of the room. But before um, we close things out, uh, I think our panel deserves a la one last round of applause. So thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, really amazing present, uh, presentations and really um, very, very cool work. I mean, I don't think there's really any other way to say it. Um, I'd also like to th say thanks once again to Representative Tonko and his great staff at SEEK for helping us with the room today, and our congressional friends, uh, Chairman Lucas and Representative Ross, for joining us with their pre recorded remarks. Um, I was going to thank all of our friends at ERE, but then I would just be listing the, you know, reading the staff list. It's like reading the phone book. But thanks to everyone at ERE. Uh, and, and across the Department of Energy for helping us with our event today. Uh, and, and that obviously extends to Meyer and everyone at the labs as well. So thank you very, very much uh, for all of that. I'd like to um, thank my colleagues, Dan O'Brien, Omri, Allison, Aaron, Anna, Molly, who's celebrating a birthday today, Molly, uh, and Nicole, uh, for all of the work that they put into our briefing today. And this is our first briefing, second briefing, second briefing of 2024. But the first with our interns, Mo uh, Emily and Megan are in the back of the room. So um, they uh, obviously made important tr uh, contributions as well. And Scott, thank you. Uh, couldn't do it without you as well. We will be back on February 15th for our next briefing about innovations in weather forecasting for a changing climate. Uh, and then on Leap Day, the 29th, we managed to fit three briefings into February, thanks to the Leap Year. Understanding the budget and appropriations process, you won't want to miss that. Uh, this is a survey, uh, if you have a moment in the room or online to take the survey, to tell us what you thought of our event today, we'd really appreciate it. We read every response, uh, and uh, if you have any suggestions for improvements or topics or things like that. Thank you again, panelists, for an amazing session, and we will be back in a couple weeks. And until then, I hope everyone has a great rest of your Thursday uh, and a nice weekend. Thank you so much. Thank you.